thank you for joining me and um, on the journey through Resiliency Village. You may have started this journey last year when Mark Dyken was here and presenting at this wonderful conference. Mark Dyken is our executive director and along with Shelly Munez and myself, we are the executive team. Resiliency Village came out of the work that Mark and Shelly were doing, working on the Tuolumne County Task Force. And I was doing with Mark, implementing trauma-informed practices at Jamestown School District. And we started talking about the similarities between the children and families we were seeing at Jamestown School and their, their, the, the trauma that we were seeing in those in the, in the kiddos, and the same kind of behaviors that Shelly and Mark were seeing at, in, in the camps. And the more we talked, the more we realized that those, that, that trauma um, and homelessness were interconnected. And excuse, just one minute, please. There's no PowerPoint up here. Sorry, another little technical glitch. So the, there we go. Uh, next, please. So the interconnectedness of, of trauma and homelessness became very apparent to us. And the more we w visited the camps and listened to the, the trauma stories and the trauma history of people in the camps, the more we began to really suspect fact that if trauma wasn't the root cause of homelessness, it was one of the very, uh, very closely related trauma and homelessness seem to go together. And we started talking about what it would take if we were wanting to lift people up out of homelessness. And we realized very quickly that the strategies that we were using in, in our schools to work with traumatized children were some of the same similar strategies that we would need to work with people experiencing homelessness. And we developed a model that put a trauma healing center in the very center, and then some of those strategies around it so that we could get a clear conceptual model of what we needed to do. And so we looked at things like financial literacy, uh, tenant and landlord relations, men mental, physical, and dental health, career development, education, and animal therapy, and um, music therapy, and, and a whole array of different traditional and non-traditional therapies that we felt would help us serve the people with whom um, we intended to serve those people who were experiencing homelessness. So we created a mission. So as you can see, Resiliency Village's mission is to improve the quality of life for our unsheltered and otherwise traumatized citizens. We provide fundamental on-site services, creative art therapies, skill building and the model of a healthy lifestyle, supporting the opportunity for a self-sustaining future through housing, healing and hope. Next, please. Once we got our mission statement kind of crystallized, we had to put our plans into, into a formal document and so we, met with the Small Business Development Center and we wrote a business plan. And when we got through with that process, we started our application for our 501c3. At the same time, we knew that this was not a project that we could do on our own. It was gonna take a whole community, a whole village to build a village. And so we started our community outreach. And we talked to everybody and anybody who would listen. We talked to um, individuals, we talked to groups, anybody that would invite us for a presentation, we did. And we spent, a, and still spend, a great deal of time you know, doing presentations in the county so that we can help 
people to understand the work that we are intending to do. We also knew that we were going to have to have a really close relationship with the county because the county was the, the one who was going to help us with regulations and they were going to um, be the one who uh, approved permits, etc. So we made an appointment with the um, Community Resources Agency, that's Building and Fire Advent and Environmental Health and Planning. And we sat down and we talked to them about what we were intending to do. At the same time, we had to keep looking for funding. And um, so we wrote a grant to the Continuum of Care in Tuolumne County. And we worked with three major donors um, to understand what we were doing. And so besides the individual donations that we, we were receiving from all the people we had talked to, we had some pretty foundational funding. And with that in hand, we started our property search. And we thought that we had found the perfect property right off, eight acres, half of it was, was undeveloped. So we would have an opportunity to build a tiny house village there for our residents for transitional housing. And the other side of the property had three buildings, one with lots of offices, one with which would, would be the performing arts center, and another that would be an emergency shelter. And we liked the property so much that we did it, we leased it, and then we started negotiations with the landowner. And we started out at $1 million. And before we got through the, the negotiations, the price of the property was $2.2 .2 million. <laughs> so we knew that was a, a very rich for our blood. And we pulled out of those negotiations and started looking again. We looked at multiple properties. And finally, we landed on some, the property that we bought, which is 40 acres on the top of Big Hill. And um, what we were looking for was something that was a little further away from residents, from people in uh, neighborhoods because we had run into some NIMBY issues when we were looking at one piece of property and we thought that maybe a little farther out would solve that problem. So when we got to our property, next slide please, we noticed that um, it was very peaceful and serene and so that was what we were looking for and so we bought that property. Well, enter project room key. In the middle of all of this, the pandemic hit. And we have in Tuolumne County, there was a large encampment called Camp Hope. And the county was very concerned that the pandemic and COVID would get started in the camps, that it would spread rapidly because of the living conditions, and that people were not only going to get very sick, but would die. And so they asked us if we would help them by doing outreach into the camps, finding the people who were the most vulnerable to COVID and put them in motels and doing the case management. And we knew that that was gonna be a diversion. We were really concerned that we would spend our time doing that instead of getting Resiliency Village opened. But at the same time, we're very pragmatic. So we realized that that would provide us some extra funding. And at the same time, it would allow us to have some experience working with the people who we were going to eventually serve. And we felt like that opportunity to learn and grow while we were doing the work, while we were housing people in motels would be a huge benefit for us. So we agreed to the county's proposal. And so for six months, we case managed uh, uh, in the neighborhood of 60 people. Um, some of them came, some of them left because it wasn't uh, what they expected or the conditions were too restrictive for them. 
But we eventually had in two different motels about 28 people. Two different motels because one hotel was for people who had substance abuse issues that they were working on recovery, but they needed intensive services. And then another section, another hotel of people who had already dealt with their addictions and were just in that stage where they were learning to be strong and resilient. Well, like every funding, any grant you, you have ever heard of, Project Room Key was coming to an end. So on July 20th, the county told us that as of August 31st, there would be no more funding for Project Room Key, no more funding for people in hotels, and we needed to start to make exit plans. So we began the exit plans for everyone, and we wrote exit plans for about uh, 16 of the, the people who were currently in the hotels, found alternative housing for their, them, but the exit plans for 12 of those people was, was for them to come to Resiliency Village. So on August 31st, the funding ended and yikes, we had 12 people who were coming to Resiliency Village. Next slide, please. Uh, we, we have had a, a great deal of successes and at the same time as many challenges. So on September 21st, we headed up to the hotel we had everybody packed up and ready to go, and we took them to Resiliency Village. Next slide, please. So 12 villagers off to Resiliency Village, and when they got there, this is what welcomed them. Next slide, please. So this is the view of the property from the front of the house. Next slide, please. And this is the view of the property from the back side of the house. So as you can see, we're in the mountains. It's very green. It's very rural. It's very peaceful. Next slide, please. This is inside Resiliency Village. Those beautiful paintings were from a local artist. She did a whole series on traumatized children, and she donated all of those to us for our, for our home. Next slide, please. Picture of the front room, next slide, please. And the fireplace, next slide, please. And the kitchen, you can see for 12 people, the kitchen is kind of small, but you know, future plans for, for enlarging it, but you know, we're making it work. Next slide, please. This is a new addition that we're putting on to bedrooms and a bathroom. Next slide, please. And this is our executive director, Mark Dyken, who is rescuing tadpoles from the swimming pool that we inherited that green pea soup. And Mark's niece wanted tadpoles. So he's rescuing tadpoles. Next slide, please. And this is once the pool man did his magic, this is what it looks like from, uh, from the decking off, off the side of the house. Next slide. Everything in Resiliency Village was donated. Next slide, please. So mattresses, beds, dressers, kitchen items, towels, linen, everything that you would need to stock a house came from our community. And we would tell people what we needed, or they would call and say, what do you need? We would ask and we would receive. This is one of our villagers getting mattresses um, out of storage for us to send up to Resiliency Village. The only things we did buy were just those household items like soaps and laundry soap and dish soap and toilet paper and paper towels, that kind of thing. Next slide, please. We were so fortunate at every presentation we went to, people volunteered to help. So we had a, a wonderful cadre of volunteers, 160. So we called on those volunteers to help us out. Next slide, please. 
So here's a group of volunteers from a faith-based organization who are helping us clean the kitchen, uh, taking out the old linoleum, scrubbing the cupboards, getting things ready to stock the kitchen. Next slide, please. This is a, a chicken coop that was donated to us. And um, the people who brought it to us all donated labor, donated trucks, et cetera. And they are getting the coop, the chicken coop in to where it's going to go. Next slide, please. This is a volunteer who is working in one of the bathrooms. He is putting in a new, they put in a new bathtub and he's putting in a new surround. Next slide, please. Um, the property at Resiliency Village came with 13 raised beds and 26 fruit trees. They had not been touched for two years. The property had sat without anybody living there for two years. Next, please. So this is what it looked like. <laughs> so you can see they had a lot of work to do. So some of those wonderful volunteers happen to be master gardeners. And here they are cleaning out the raised beds. Uh, they put it in, not only did they have to clean all of that out, but they put in new fertilizer and new soil. Next slide, please. And here you can see the front bed that's kind of ready to go and they're still working, working away on that. So once they got the beds all cleaned, this whole group, next slide, please. They got the, the beds cleaned, as you can see, another group of volunteers, master gardeners came behind them and they planted them. So you can see the little plants in the, in the background. Next slide, please. And this is what the gardens look like during the summer as we enjoyed the wonderful vegetables from the garden. On the other side of the screen, there are grapes and kiwis. So really we had fresh fruit and vegetables to share with our villagers all summer long. Next slide, please. We have been very fortunate to be supported by the community. And whenever we have asked for something, we have been fortunate to, to receive it. Next slide, please. So we had put out there that we wanted a tanker fire truck that we could use as part of our fire mitigation plan. This is one of our villagers who went down to, to check out a fire truck that someone had said, I know where there is one and I'll go with you to check it out. Next slide, please. This is that pool area you saw earlier. And when we arrived at Resiliency Village, we found that there were two Indian grinding stones and we were very uncomfortable that they were there because they were not in their natural environment. They were not where they had intended, where they had intended to be. And the former owners had taken, had taken them and they had placed them on the pool area for decoration. So we contacted our local chicken ranch tribal council. We asked them if they wanted those grinding stones. They said they did not, but they offered to come out and bless them for us. So the picture you're seeing is a blessing ceremony. All of our villagers were there and these are two tribal members who are out not only just blessing the stones, they were blessing the entire property and they were blessing the project itself. So we've been very fortunate to have this wonderful support, not only from our larger community, but from the Miwoks um, and the tribal council. They gave us a very large donation to help us buy this property. Next slide, please. So I thought it would be interesting for you to know a little bit about the day-to-day -day stuff. What's, what goes on every day? Next slide, please. Everybody checks in and out. It's a safety issue so that we know where people are. Then in case of an emergency, we know who might need some support and who doesn't. So villagers check out, staff members check in and out. And as you can see, it also has become a place for messages. and. Um, 
and it's it's actually worked out pretty well. It's right there in the door that goes outside. Next slide, please. All villagers have tasks. So um, they have house tasks, which is kind of what you see. They sign up for the tasks that they want to do. They also have outside tasks. Each villager works about two hours a day. They have about that much work that has to be done just in order to maintain the house and the grounds. So it continues to be a lovely place. They also sign up for dinner. And so they, um, there's another one of these that's for, that has uh, dinner nights for dinner where they can sign up for dinner. They also do their own laundry. Um, they all pay rent. So they pay 30% of whatever income they have with a $350 cap. And if they don't have any income, which there are a couple of our residents who do not, they uh, work extra hours around the, the village to be able to compensate for the fact that they don't have any, any rent. We also have weekly meetings on Tuesday nights that are mandatory, where at that time people come, our villagers come with our staff and we talk about things that have gone well during the week, things that we might have to address, any kind of announcements that, that, there, that there are. And when we talk about gratitude, and um, it, it's, a, it's a, a really critical time for us. We also have once a week room checks so that rooms stay in order. And, and we have random drug testing. Next slide, please. We have not been without our challenges, to say the least. Not necessarily our biggest challenge, but a big challenge was that when we came to Resiliency Village on September 1st, we, we were not ready. And we knew we were not ready but the alternative was not acceptable to us. So the alternative was to allow those 12 people that we talked about to um, go back on the streets. And we could not in good consciousness allow that to happen and, and um, put on them some more trauma from, from you know, they already had enough piled on and we were not willing to do that. So we scrambled, we scrambled, we brought in extra help. We saw some volunteers, we brought in more people to help us. And for six weeks, we worked night and day to get the village ready for people to come. Our focus was a warm, safe, comfortable place where everybody had a room, everybody had clean linens and fresh towels, plenty of food and, um, and then all of the other things that you can imagine would um, not have, would not are not ready. We had rules. We had rules posted in every in every room. We had you know fire extinguishers and smoke detectors and those kinds of safety things. We had procedures that we went over with them and had them sign. Um, but there were lots of things that were not perfect. On top of that, our site managers, we have a couple who are site managers and she got COVID. And so right in the middle of trying to get people moved in, our site managers, she got COVID. And so they went into quarantine. So on September 1st, when we brought everybody up, we had no night site managers. And so it happened that Lark and Shelly and I 24 seven were the site managers. So we spent the night there, we spent the day there. <laughs> and uh, uh, the one site manager, the male came back on September 3rd, the female who had COVID did not come back until September 10th. So that was a pretty exhausting time for us. Um, Working within the zoning regulations has been a little tough. As you know, every property you buy has regulations. But the biggest problem for us was that the county does not have any zoning regulations for tiny houses. That had always been our model that we were going to put people, the house itself would be the emergency shelter, 
the tiny houses would be transitional housing. But although the county has been working on regulations for accessory dwelling units, they do not have any tiny house regulations. So that's kind of holding us up. And we're trying to be really creative to live within the, the zoning regulations um, while still moving forward with our project. I'd love to tell you that we didn't have any NIMBY issues, not in my backyard, but that would just be false. We've had some NIMBY issues that we've looked through. We've had some NIMBY issues that are ongoing. Our biggest opposition comes from a very affluent community in our county who, whose, whose housing residences are about two miles away as the crow flies, about 12 miles away as you drive. And for some reason, they have found us a threat, us as a threat. And they've um, put up some pretty fierce opposition. And um, they're kind of, kind of mobilized and they um, harassed people at the, the county. They, um, they threatened to recall the supervisors who have supported us. So we just finally had to decide, it was really distracting us from our work and we finally had to decide that we were just gonna move forward with integrity and work toward our mission. And so that's what we, how we have handled it. We deal with what we have to deal with, but we move forward. The, the, the net result of that is that our relationship with the county is not what it used to be. So the county now is being very, very careful. They want no, they will, no perception of there being any kind of specialized treatment for us. And so now everything has to be, the T's are crossed and the I's are dotted. And a good example of that, <clears throat> excuse me, is that we applied for permits for the renovation of the house on June 30th, and we're still waiting for the approval of our permits. Another thing that we hadn't thought much about, but became a bit of a challenge was communal living. So thinking about people who have been experiencing homelessness, living in camps, in cars, in tents, um, and then putting them in a hotel for six months, they, and then we threw them into living in together in a house. And <laughs> I don't know why we hadn't thought all that through, but we had it. And so, of course, there have been some issues, um, especially in the first couple weeks around just how do you do that? So lots of training, lots of conflict resolution, trying to figure out how we navigate living together. And then um, Mark likes to call it work muscles. <laughs> So folks were not, um, were not living um, and having to work to contribute to the upkeep of a, of a home. And so there's lots of reminders going on, a little few more reminders than we'd like, but we keep reminding ourselves it's a work in progress, it's coming along, and we're going to just keep developing those work muscles. Next slide, please. So I'd like to to just spend the next few minutes talking to you about what we call success stories, stories of hope and healing. And so I like to call the first one, the chicken and the eggs. Next slide, please. Next slide. So this beautiful chicken is Tildy and she and her sisters, she has nine sisters who, who live with us. And um, she is, uh, um, it's such a beautiful chicken. Next slide, please. And here's our first egg. So I had to just show you that. Next slide, please. Here is where the chickens live in this lovely space in two different coops that were all donated and, um, and all the chickens were donated. So um, next slide, please. And here are the chickens just happily eating. These chickens are taken care of by a couple, a married couple, Shauna and John. And Shauna and John are responsible for everything to do with chicken care. So they feed, they water, they clean up chicken poop, they put in new nesting material, they collect eggs, and they love these chickens. 
So one day we were all outside in the summer is a beautiful day and we heard laughing and giggling. And so we all walked over to see what was happening in the chicken yard. And there was for Sean and Jana, uh, Sean, I'm sorry, Jana and Sean, sorry. And they were, um, John was holding a couple chickens and the chickens were all around their feet. Sean had on a pair of flip flops and the chickens were all around her and the giggling and the laughing were happening because the chickens were poking and pecking at her painted toenails. It was priceless. Next slide, please. Chris, next slide. I'd like you to meet Chris. Chris is our rock star. Chris is an aged out foster youth. According to his own story, he was kicked out of high school at 18 because he was a bad influence. He got married, he had a child, subsequently got divorced and became homeless. Chris came to us on September 1st and we asked him once he got in and felt safe if he wanted to continue his education. He said yes. So we contact the County Office of Education who sent a teacher. Um, Chris met with the teacher once initially he was going to get his GED, but after meeting with the teacher, he decided he wanted his high school diploma. And after um, cooking family dinners, Chris also realized he loves to cook. So Chris is now duly enrolled in high school and in Columbia College Culinary Arts program. He's also our go-to guy. He holds down two part-time jobs and he is working to get custody of his daughter back. Next slide, please. The dump, next slide, please. What you're seeing here is what I call the dump. Next slide, please. So one day we were outside, we heard the garbage truck or so we thought coming down our road and um, we waited for the garbage truck to arrive, it never did. So the next morning, one of our villagers was leaving and she called in hysterics because she found this mess right outside of our gate. She knew that the villagers would be blamed for making this kind of a mess. So we immediately called One Pile at a Time, which is a nonprofit organization that cleans up dump sites. And we asked them if they would allow us to be one of their projects, they agreed. When they came, half of our villagers went down to help them clean out the dump site. The other half went, stayed up at the village and made lunch. So when they were ready for lunch, they all came up and they sat down with the, with the volunteers from one pile at a time. And they uh, had lunch together. And when things were calmed down and people started to wander, one of those volunteers had asked Shelly if she would gather all the villagers around. He had something he needed to tell them. And Shelly was reluctant because she did not know what he was going to, going to say. And, but she agreed and she brought them all around. And once they were there, he, he said to them, thank you for coming and listening to me. I have something that I need to say to you. And he said, I was, a, I was an opponent of this project. I have verbally said things about you and I have been in total opposition to what's been happening here. And I need to apologize to you. He said, I made some assumptions and I was wrong. And I humbly ask you to forgive me for what I have, I have done in the past. That will happen no longer after being here and being among you and seeing you. I've changed my mind and from now on, I'm an absolute proponent of what's going on here. And he gave them all of this business card and he said, if there is anything that you need, all you have to do is call me. Next slide, please. Family dinners. <laughs> Next slide, please. So we started, um, Shelly and Mark and I thought this would be a great way to build community. 
So all of our villagers uh, were told when they when they came that they were going to have make their own breakfast and lunch, but we would have family dinners together and that they were lining up to cook dinner. And they were a little reluctant at first. So we had some grousing, we had reluctance to sign up. We heard, I don't know how to cook. We heard, I don't know very many recipes, but we, I don't cook very well. And we said, it's okay. No, well, it's all good, we'll cook with you. And so we did. So we cooked right alongside them. And um, lo and behold, a lot of good food came out of that kitchen. And uh, we all sat down together and the first couple nights was really a beautiful thing where we heard things like, um, I haven't eaten, I can't think of one I've eaten with a family before. This is just like family. There were grins in their faces from ear to ear. And, um, and they just sat and visited with each other like any family would do. Well, we noticed that over time, people were signing up and that, um, that the, we were scrambling to get some dinner on the table at six o'clock every night. And so we thought we'd better talk with them and see what was going on. So we met with them on, in, in one of our Tuesday night meetings and we asked them what was happening. And they just said, yeah, you know, it's just too much. It's just too much. We only wanna meet on Sundays. We only wanna have dinner together on Sundays. So we said, okay, if that's what you need, that's what we'll do. So I was cooking on Tuesday, Thursday night anyway. So I just went ahead and cooked on Thursday and I set the table and rang the bell and they all showed up. So what we've been noticing now is that lots of people are cooking. So Tuesday night tacos, we've had somebody make a ham and mashed potatoes. And so what we're finding now is that people are, are signing up to make family dinners and obviously they must have liked it a little bit more than they thought they did. Next slide, please. I wanna just spend a minute on community. So next slide, please. What you see here are just chickens, of course, <laughs> but just people sitting together, building community. Next slide, please. And every uh, week we have crafting going on. So we have a volunteer, either a volunteer crafter or a volunteer artist who comes and we all uh, to do, do some project together and just as an opportunity to build community. So as you look at these pictures um, and you watch them and doing, completing their projects and building community, I invite you to look at their faces and see healing and hope. Thank you very much. Next slide. Thank you, Brenda. Um, if there are any questions, you can put them in the Q&A. We have five more minutes. And I apologize, I forgot to say that at the beginning, <laughs> things in the Q&A. We do have five more minutes if anyone wants to throw a quick question in there before we close at 1.15. And while we wait for that, I'll say, Brenda, thank you so, so much for that wonderful heartwarming presentation. You're welcome. Here's a question. How does one volunteer for this? Do you need volunteers? The, quest, the answer is we always need volunteers because someone might have a skill that um, we don't have on our volunteer list. So we always need volunteers. On our webpage, which will be on the next slide, you'll see our website uh, address. And there is a form there if you'd like to volunteer. We love volunteers. Besides, Mark is paid staff, the site managers are paid staff, the rest of us are all volunteers, and, and everybody has something that they can bring to Resiliency Village, so we would love to have you volunteer. Thank you. Thank you, Brenda, and from Susan Raisin, not a question, but I am so mm -hmm. impressed with all that you folks have to do to make this happen. Thank you. <laughs> it's been worth it. If you see the 
interact with the people every day. You see their faces, you see them safe, you see that they know that they have a home. You see some guy who was formerly homeless sitting on the, in the sun on a chair reading a book like, like a regular person. It is just so heartwarming. It's such good work and we are grateful to be able to do it. And Susan, again, is there any way to show our political support or help deal with the obstacles related to NIMBY? Well, I, that's a great question and a wonderful offer. Um, I think any kind of uh, letter writing, positive letter writing, any of that kind of thing is really helpful. Um, that's really the best way to do it. The way we do, what we do is we invite people to come and we would love to invite you to come up to Resiliency Village, see what we do. We 100% of the people who have come up and talked to us and seen our place and seen our villagers have been supporters. So that is has been our strategy. We have to show people that we're not a threat, that the work we're doing is good work that these people are just people. There are neighbors, there are friends, and they just have had some hard times and somebody needs to give them a, a lift and, and we're happy to do that work and we invite you to come see what we do. Thank you. We do have two more minutes if anyone has a question or Brenda, if you have anything additional that you'd like to add mm. that you didn't get to. Well, the one thing I would have liked to show you are more faces, uh, you know, of more people. Of uh, there have been a, so many more stories since um, since I prepared this, and just um, I just want to just say that we, Mark and his band, Clan Dyken. He marks from Calaveras. You may know his, him and his band. They came and they practiced in, in our front room a couple of days ago during dinner. And it was such an amazing experience. They did poke Sally to Annie just by kind of impromptu. Two of our villagers, one of them who's had four strokes, the other a 69 year old woman got up in the dining room and started dancing. Those are the kinds of things that help us to continue to do this work. And we know that even with distractors, we're on the right path to hope and to healing and to raising up people and giving them some dignity. And that is a beautiful ending statement. Thank you, Brenda Chapman. Thank you, participants. Thank you for Enjoy being here. Enjoy the rest here. of the conference. Thank you.